Good morning. Always good to be here with you on the first day of the week. <clears throat> Last week we were in Henderson, Tennessee with Jessica's family and uh, we were able to visit with her home congregation where she grew up and a number of those who worshiped there that we both knew through college. And so throughout those that I was able to see and to visit with, there was a recurring question. Aren't you glad you got a Sunday off? Aren't you glad? What a blessing for you that you got to sit and listen to someone else preach today. And that's true. I enjoyed being able to hear men of God proclaim his word. But I'm so glad to be in the pulpit today. I love to proclaim the word of God for his glory. And I'm glad that you're here today. Today this lesson begins a new series in our study of Elijah, the prophet of the Lord. He first appears in 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 1. We'll be studying beginning at 1 Kings chapter 16 verse 29 together this morning. In the Bible class we noted several aspects from this text that we could learn about the people of God, about the leadership of King Ahab who married the Canaanite princess Jezebel, and about the prophet Elijah. And as we continue examining this text together now in the worship period, I would like to look at the Lord. You see, we noted things about the people who served and also who rebelled against the Lord in the class. But I would like for us to note together from this same text what we can see and know about the one true God. That is why Brother Cecil read for us Psalm 113, perhaps one of the most beautiful praises of the one true God, that in the middle of that praise, the rhetorical question is asked, who is like the Lord our God? There is none like him. And so as we examine this text together, let us notice what we can learn about our God. First of all, we can see in the context of 1 Kings chapter 16 that God, the Lord, had been forgotten. This is what the inspired author tells us. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab the son of Omri began to reign over Israel. And Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Eth Baal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days he, El of Bethel, built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. See Joshua chapter 6, verse 26. How could a people forget a God like Yahweh? We come together every first day of the week to do as Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, to proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called us out of darkness and into His marvelous light. How could a people 
forget a God like the Lord. It began with one man turning away. One man choosing to rebel against his God. And it led to this point, now six decades of darkness in Israel. Six decades of idolatry, of trying to please Yahweh while going after other gods. And we noted in the class this morning that things reach their worst with Ahab as step by step he defied word by word the things that God had declared to his people before he brought them into the promised land in Deuteronomy chapter 7. You see, it is not by putting him out of mind that a people forget God. But it is by simply one decision to turn away and not correcting that decision immediately. Forgotten. And when the Lord is forgotten, when a nation forgets the Lord, there are consequences. This is what we see in 1 Kings chapter 16. That not only does their king Ahab build a house and an altar and ashram for false gods, but the people have forgotten God to the point that they take action that is against their own interest. He all builds Jericho in direct contradiction to Joshua chapter 6, not knowing that it will cost him his two sons. When a nation forgets the Lord, there are consequences that could be avoided if they only paid attention to His Word. Notice the promise that is made. Notice what is said by the psalmist in Psalm 33, beginning at verse 10. Psalm 33, beginning at verse 10. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of His heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom He has chosen as His heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where He sits enthroned, He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. By its great might, it cannot rescue. Through the leadership of Ahab, the nation of Israel put its faith in a false god. In a marriage to Jezebel, Ahab sought political peace, security, stability. He also sought plenty. Because from that treaty would come free trade between two nations with different economies. Israel with great farmland. Phoenicia, the Sidonians, with the ability to procure things from afar. So that on its face it would appear that by this treaty, Ahab not only gains a wife and a God who offers prosperity, but an alliance with a nation, 
peace and plenty. What does the psalmist say? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The wisdom of the nations is folly to God. Don't put your trust in the things of man. The war horse cannot bring peace. You know, we referred just a moment ago to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. Because, Peter tells us, we today are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Blessed is the nation whose Lord, whose God is the Lord. Today, it's not about a nation established by God politically, but a kingdom He has made of His people, the church. And forgetting the Lord does not mean that we cease to know His name, but we ceased to do His will. And we've chased after false gods that claim to bring us peace and prosperity. And so have we forgotten the way that Israel did? There is none like the Lord. Notice then what the text tells us. That God brings a prophet to rebuke the nation that had forgotten him. The Lord rebukes the people by the word of Elijah, the Tishbite of Tishba and Gilead, who said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Elijah appears. Even his name declares the excellency of his God. Yahweh is my God is the meaning of his name. And he comes with a single message. There will not be dew nor rain. Because you have forgotten the God who provides it. Because you have turned to other gods. And by the power of God, Elijah reveals the counterfeit promises of the man-made God, Baal. Baal, the God of thunder and rain, is exposed as a fraud by the one true God who says, there will not be a drop of rain or dew on the land. Now, this is a rebuke from the Lord. Who is like the Lord? He is a God who rebukes. Is it because He's angry? Is it because He doesn't like people, His creation, His nation? Now, come to see and to understand that rebuke given in love is a form of mercy. God could have allowed the children of Israel, the northern kingdom, to be destroyed. He already had the southern kingdom and at the time of Ahab, Asa, who is judged in Scripture as a good and faithful king reigning over the southern tribes, he did not need Israel. And yet, he sends a prophet to them. And yet, he gives them an opportunity to return to him. Who among us, if someone we loved was hurtling towards the edge of a cliff, ready to go into death, would not do everything in our power to see that that did not take place. Even if it meant tackling the one we love, it would be worth the cuts and the bruises to keep them from going to their death. And so it is here. Suffer a little while, Israel. No dew. No rain. So that you will know 
that I am the Lord who sends the rain. Yes, when we come to understand the nature and the character of God, we see that rebuke given in love is a form of mercy. And this is what the wise men in Proverbs 15 says. You can see it in several verses in this chapter of Proverbs, as well as throughout the Proverbs. In Proverbs 15, especially verses 5 and 31 and following. The wise man says, A fool despises his father's instruction, but whoever heeds reproof, rebuke, is prudent or wise. Verse 31, The ear that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself. But he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. The fear of the Lord is instruction and in wisdom, and humility comes before honor. The Lord forgotten. The Lord rebuked. The Lord qualified Elijah. As soon as he had completed his prophetic word, the Lord spoke to him, saying, Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Kareth, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Kareth, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. And after a while the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. At Kareth, Elijah learned to trust in the Lord's provision. But he also suffered because of his nation's sins. The very rebuke that he proclaimed by the word of the Lord meant that the brook that provided his own drinking water dried up. And doubtlessly, this experience served to strengthen and qualify Elijah for the ministry that was to come. The message of Scripture is that suffering is a tool that God uses for His people. Read the book of Acts. Throughout that book, throughout the various persecutions that the early Christians faced, time and again, we find them rejoicing in their suffering. And Paul teaches that in his letters, including... In the reference there on the screen, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul now imprisoned for the second time, not knowing the outcome of his imprisonment. This is likely the last letter that he wrote. Tells Timothy, his son in the faith, Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord nor of me his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Our God is a God who rebukes and who qualifies, who trains, yes, even through suffering. This is not to make light 
of suffering, but to recognize its place in our life as the people of God. Last of all, though, he's a God who redeems. The New Testament teaches us that the whole of Scripture points us to the Savior, Jesus the Christ. So I want to note with you three ways in which this text points to and is most fulfilled in our Savior the Christ. First of all, the nation of Israel had forgotten the Lord. And this is something that happened over and over and over again throughout the time of the nation of Israel's existence. Even the southern tribes were not wholly faithful to God. Assyria came and destroyed the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom carried off into Babylonian captivity. A remnant eventually was able to return. But even in the days of Jesus, the nation was not faithful to God. And so Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20. The angel is speaking to Joseph, who is betrothed to Mary. And this is what he says to him. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Elijah came announcing rebuke. But even he could not save the people. But Christ came to pay the price for forgetting the Lord. All of us, at some point, have forgotten the Lord. And as his people, he has died now for our sins. Then we notice the rebuke. Jesus' ministry was a ministry preaching, proclaiming repentance. Over and over and over again we see Him rebuking the sins of the people. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, we find the purpose statement of Jesus' ministry on earth, according to Mark. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Yes, his was a ministry of rebuke. What would Elijah say to us today? What would Jesus say? I have no doubt that the message would include a call to repentance. To repent of half-hearted service to God. To repent of trusting in anyone or anything other than the one true God. And then finally we see that the Lord qualified Jesus through suffering. The Hebrews writer says, in Hebrews chapter 5, beginning at verse 7, this. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. By his suffering, 
by his patient suffering and obedience, Christ paid the price for your sins and for mine. He prayed, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. And so by his suffering we are able to receive eternal salvation. And in his suffering we have an enduring example. Suffering may be intense. It may be difficult. It may be long. We also recognize that in Christ and through Christ and because of Christ, when we suffer, it is for the glory of God. Ella Wilcox put it this way in, in a poem that she wrote. All those who journey, soon or late, must pass through Gethsemane's gate, must kneel alone in darkness there and battle with some fierce despair. God pity those who cannot say, not mine but thine, who only pray, let this cup pass, and cannot see the purpose in Gethsemane. Forgotten, rebuked, qualified, redeemed. Who is like the Lord? There is none like Him. Perhaps you need what only He can provide for you today. If so, this invitation is for you as we stand and sing together.